Okay. Hello, everybody. Can you sort of roughly hear me? I've been told to talk into this microphone, and I'm not sure what exactly that means. Like, in, into this microphone would be like that. And then I'm not quite sure how, how that works. Um, I'm, I'm really deeply honored to have been invited to do this. Um, this is our second gig. The first gig was at the Manil Collection in Houston, um, courtesy of the lovely Toby Camps, who I see sitting here in the third row. Um, in a way, it's all his fault um, that Haim and I made such good friends with each other. Um, I'm very, very touched to be here. And um, for some reason, I'm the first person speaking, and it's very odd that I'm the first person speaking to me. I mean, you know, I'm one of these sort of philosophy people, and I'm supposed to tell you what it all means, you know. So you can, like, not have the inconvenience of, like, experiencing it, you know. Um, thank, thank you for laughing. But you see, the thing is that the philosophy that I do is so, um, it's so different from that. It's actually the kind of philosophy where art is always in front of philosophy. There's some philosophy where philosophers think, oh, we know more than art, right? Like, we're this Pac-Man that's going to, like, eat culture and, like, tell you what it means, right? The, the philosophy that I do, which is called object-oriented ontology, um, from that point of view, art is always in, the, in front, right? So it's more like I'm learning how to do my work from what I see in Heim's work. And so it's rather odd that I'm the first person speaking, but, you know, I'm a nice, polite Englishman, so I will do my best um, to say something. And the first thing that I would like to do, actually, is read a, read, read a poem. Um, I can't pretend to be the author of this poem. The, 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 the author of this poem is E. E. Cummings. And I have, in a way, put this poem on a kind of shelf um, and slightly rearranged it, which is a little bit like what Haim does all the time. And um, it's a poem about how things get subtly rearranged and how things, when they're subtly rearranged, change their significance in, in quite profound and powerful ways. Um, and I think the subtlety is important, right? The subtlety, yeah? So I'm just going to read this one first, and then, and then maybe we'll talk a little bit more. Okay. But if you know the E.E. E. Cummings poem I'm talking about, it's called Spring. It's like a perhaps hand. And I think that Haim is also like a perhaps hand. So I decided to change this poem a little bit. Haim is like a perhaps hand, which comes carefully out of nowhere, arranging a window into which people look while people stare. That's E. Cummings calling. <laughs> I've got it wrong already. It? While, while, while people stare, arranging and changing, placing carefully there, a strange thing and a known thing here, and changing everything carefully. Haim is like a perhaps hand in a window, carefully to and fro, moving new and old things, while people stare carefully, moving a perhaps fraction of flower here, placing an inch of air there, and without breaking anything. So, you know, we've been in this kind of um, artistic space for maybe like a hundred years or so, maybe, a, may, may, maybe even 200, where the point has been to um, create the right kind of fish bowl for human beings to see stuff out of. And, 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 and the name of the fish bowl is, is ism, right? There's all kinds of isms. We have modernism, romanticism, postmodernism, impressionism, right? An ism kind of means um, finding the right kind of subjectivity, which is inevitably thought of as a human subjectivity with which to look 
at things, right? And we play this game, right? And it's like, well, my fishbowl is better than yours. You know, I've, I've, got, I've, I've got a really nice one. It's got the right tint, you know, it's bigger than yours. I have better reasons why mine is better. And, um, you know, this is all the fault of a philosopher from the later 18th century called Immanuel Kant, who was so correct, right? He, he basically said, you can never see reality without being inside this fishbowl. You can never see reality outside of your fishbowl, yeah? For him, the fishbowl was called transcendental subject, right? There's a bunch of other possibilities for the, what the fishbowl is called, right? Like, for Hegel, the fishbowl is called spirit, which kind of means like the spirit of the age, you know, the, 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 the zeitgeist. For Marx, the fishbowl is called human economic relations. That's the thing that makes things real for, for, for Marx. Um, for Nietzsche, the fishbowl is called will to power, right? That's what makes things true for Nietzsche. And for Heidegger, the thing is called Dasein, right, being there, which he thinks of as purely a hu human being, kind of a syndrome, yeah. And in particular, a German human being syndrome, because we all know German fishbowls are much better than other fishbowls. We all sort of know that. Thank you for laughing again. Thank God you laugh. It's very good for my ego. <laughs> so, um... The, 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 the problem is that Kant said something else as well. And he said something else that everyone like totally deleted because it was too disturbing, right? The difference between these two things, the fishbowl thing that he said and this other thing. The other thing that he said was, there really is a reality. It's real, yeah? It's not your granddaddy's real because you can't touch it directly. You can only access it through your human flavored fishbowl, yeah? But like, there really is a reality and it's really different from your human being fishbowl picture of the reality, yeah? And um, the first person to freak out about this idea was Kant himself, right? Because the idea implies, and if you've got five hours, I'd love to prove it to you. <laughs> the, the idea implies that things are always a little bit like trickster, tricksters, you know, like sort of indigenous culture, first people's concept of, of, of trickster, yeah, because things are exactly what they are, yet never exactly as they appear simultaneously, right? So there's a kind of shock that happens there. And many, many philosophers try to delete the shock, right? So Hegel tries to delete the shock in a certain way. And Marx just like, oh, I'm just the same as Hegel, only flipped upside down. So he's also trying to delete the shock, right? And the shock is, without needing to like slap myself upside the head, I know that there is a reality beyond me. And I know this because I am touched on the inside by an experience which Kant calls beauty, right? And because I can have this experience, I know that there are things that aren't just me. I know that the world is not just my ego because I'm having a non-ego experience right now with this feeling, right? So I don't have to prove, yeah, that there are things. I just sort of intuit that there are things. It's very beautiful, but also it should be disturbing, right? You should be disturbed by this. Kant was disturbed by it. So he tries to police this feeling, you know, he's like, Oh, it's all very sort of proper, you know, it's got, it's got nothing to do with desire, it's got nothing to do with sexuality, it's got nothing to do with the fact that I'm fascinated by animal magnetism, and I'm not Yoda, you know, I am not Yoda, yeah, Heim, Heim has sometimes been Yoda, so, you know. Um, I'm I, not Yoda. You're not Yoda? No, I'm never Yoda. I, I, I can see that. Are you a duck? I, you, kind of. Kind of I am. You know, but, 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 but more like kind of I'm a, I'm a, I'm human, I think. Am I, am I, am I human? Are you sure? I'm not sure actually. Do you, would you like, would you like to borrow these glasses? 
I prefer this bottle cap. It's green. Okay, I've, I, I, it goes, I like, I like goes well with this wall. What about you? What about these? You like? Oh, well, nice oh, these are cool. <laughs> Can you see better? Oh, my, I'm, I'm Heim Steinbach now. I see much better, much better. Much better. Nice to meet you. Hello. I'm a, I'm a big fan of your work, which I understand you've been... And I'm a big fan of your work. This is a great book, uh, which I'm slowly, slowly reading over the last two years. Oh. <laughs> me, me too, me too. <laughs> Me too. I'm a very slow reader. It's called Realist Magic Objects Ontology Causality. What's in this book, Heim? Uh, <laughs> I found some grains, like, uh, you know, like a grain of salt. I'm, a, I'm also a big fan of salt. Great. So, um, um, what about color? What about color? Well, that's the trouble, you see. Most philosophers, do you mind if I go, like, can we swap? Yeah. yeah I'll, I'll, I'll just put that there, so as not to confuse people. The, these are the me glasses. Um, many, many Western philosophers are freaked out by what we call appearance. They don't like it. You know, they want to, like, sever reality from appearance and for the last two and a half thousand years the job of me has been to find the dotted line on a thing so that you can like you know like when you get the cereal packet with a little pe picture of the scissors and the little dotted line you know and it's like cut here right for the box top or whatever like that's our job is, is to separate appearance from reality but but Kant told you that you can't do that right and I'm like strictly adhering to this idea Normally, when philosophers separate appearance from reality, what they do is they're like, oh, color, you know, all that stuff, that's just like superficial appearance. That's not the reality. The reality is the kind of the extensional, lumpy, just bleh, you know. No scientific theory believes that, right? That's kind of like what we think is true. And that's called scientism. It's not the same as science at all. So color actually is a thing, right? If you think about it, color is a thing. It's a very subtle thing. When we say this word object, normally what happens is you kind of like see something in the mirror. You see that word as a kind of mirror and you think, oh my God, I'm seeing the worst possible thing that could happen to me ever, which is I could become objectified. Right? And, and that means I'm static and, I'm, and I've been like um, caught in somebody else's ideological force field and all that kind of stuff, right? So when people like me say the word object, people are like, oh my God, ah, oh no, you're doing the bad thing. But that's because like we've been like panicking about, about, about what this guy said 200 years ago, very unnecessarily, because what he said actually allows you to relate to non-human beings in a very non-conceptual, very deeply um, positive way, actually. And so, yeah, color, color, it's not solid, right? It's like sound, right? Sound, sound is a thing, color is a thing, a sentence is a thing, an emotion is a thing, Tim is a thing. Time is a thing. If, if, if you have trouble with thing, like just use entity, yeah? So yeah, color is a thing, right? It, it's a thing. It's a specific kind of unique thing. Um, it's not superficial. Um, nobody can own it, right? There's no way to like copyright, right? Like, it, but, but that's the same as me, right? Like if you cut me open, there's no little Intel inside symbol inside me saying this is a Tim Morton blood cell, right? This is a Tim Morton bacteria. This is a Tim Morton, you know, carpal tunnel. Yeah. Um, so like I'm composed of all kinds of things that aren't me. One way of thinking about this is that I'm open. Tim is open, right? It's not that Tim doesn't exist. It's that Tim is open. Bottle is open. 
Microphone is open. Soundwave is open. Pantone color is open. Pantone, pant doesn't own. Pan, pan, tone, pantone. I like this word pantone actually. Yeah, Pan American. Yeah. Pan American. Pan American. Pan American. Yeah. Syrinx. Yeah, something like that. Something like that. Am I, am I doing okay? How am I doing? I think you're doing very well. Um, no, I asked you about color because mm. um, uh, a critic just wrote in the Wall Street Journal that mm. that the, the subject of this show is Pantone, mm. a corporate uh, entity. Yeah. And um, hello, we're bourgeois sellouts. Hello. <laughs> and um, but how does Pantone work as element? You see, that's the thing is that. Um, when I when I um, when I'm immersed in color, I experience myself as a thing in a way, right? I um, and 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 for me, that's an experience of um, there's some kind of ungraspability about my world, right? There's some kind of gap in my world. I I, I can't hold on to it, right? We think this idea of, of world is very solid. We think that being in a world or being in an environment or being in um, you know, an ecological world means being completely in a totally solid, integrated space, but that's not true. Being in a world means being in a kind of perforated space, and that's a little bit disturbing. And this space has a very specific quality to it, Right, like it's 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 never just bleh, right? In 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 the same way that other kinds of entity are not just bleh, space always has a certain kind of frequency, right? It it, it it's more like the sort of hippie space, yeah. It has a certain kind of color, it has a certain kind of frequency, it has a certain kind of resonance to it, right? It's not just a lump. Nothing is a lump. Even a black hole is not a lump. Stephen Hawking just proved you know, his new theory of black holes. They're not just these things that just eat everything. You know, all the information that goes in the black hole is still there, right? All the color, all the momentum, all the velocity, all the, all the position, all that kind of stuff is still there in the black hole. It didn't destroy everything. It didn't just become this great big lump, yeah? So the world is never, ever just a lump decorated with color, the world is color, right? And, and, and then sometimes we want to forget that, and so we kind of hang on to these fake things that we think of as like lumps, right? But object-oriented ontology is actually saying that your reality is like shimmering liquid. Yeah, that's how you, that's how you experience things. Does it make sense? Um, does it make sense? Uh, it makes sense to me. And, um, yeah. I think another thing to say is that before you see the wall, the wall sort of is seeing you, right? Like, that's the whole point. Like, like okay, so I can't see things outside of my fishbowl, but that doesn't mean my fishbowl is everything there is. There's already something outside my fishbowl, right? And, the, and, and, and that something is beaming into my fishbowl. And so, in a way, this thing that we've been telling ourselves that, that, that we are like autonomous, free agents is a little bit funky and like um, doesn't actually really help politics even. I've been trying to write this, I'm writing this book for Verso called Solidarity with Non-Human People. And I'm trying to show that like, even if you're like a Marxist or an anarchist, you really need to realize that, that things that are not humans are not just important, but like just as important, you know? I mean, like a few years ago, um, was it last year actually? It seems a long time ago. 
we all got very upset because Cecil the lion got shot by a dentist. And I, it was a very interesting historical moment because it seemed to me that um, for many people, we now feel so beaten down by the culture we live in that we actually realize we have much more in common with a lion than with a dentist, with full apologies to any dentists in this, in this room. Um, and so it's kind of like that, right? Like, like, like the, 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 this, this wall isn't just something for me, right? Um, it's also not just something for the dust that's falling on the picture. It's not just something for some insect that crawls across it, right? It's not something just for the truck that is re reflecting its yellow light onto the picture. Um, it has its own qualities all by itself, right? And that's kind of beautiful, but, but I think it's disturbing to many, many Western sort of patriarchal um, concepts about what reality is. Because for a long time, we've been telling ourselves that reality is this plastic kind of lump that we can like format exactly as we want, right? And then the conventional interpretation of Kant, which we all read in theory class, because like every single other person after that kind of says the same thing, right? Is that reality is a kind of blank screen, right? Onto which we project our desire. It doesn't mean anything until we do the desire projection, right? Can you see how like violent that is, right? And like how you need some kind of very, very threateningly gentle, non-violent Heim Steinbach approach to like adjust that problem. I like the connection you made with the lion. Um, that, that story about the dentist shooting the lion was really uh, sensational. Yeah. Um, and uh, it, I think it even took a place in the front page of the New York Times. Yeah, it did. Um, and, uh, and I think I was thinking about that when I mm. saw the poster of the Lion King. Mm. Um, and yeah. And somehow it ended up here. Yes. Um, you know, objects bounce against objects, right? Yeah. Um, yeah, they so, bounce against objects. So I'm, I'm making that connection now. Yeah. Oh. Thank you. Well, then thank you for, uh, you know, pleasure. for bringing in the dentist. You know, someone had to do it. You know? So I wonder whether that has something to do with Hamlet, you know, the dentist and the lion. Hmm. Well, you know, The Lion King is based on the story of Hamlet. I'm, I'm a literature professor. I have no idea. Tell me about Hamlet, Heim. Well, I, I recall um, the uncle killed uh, Hamlet's father and, uh, and uh, then took his mother as his, as his wife. Yeah. Um, so... Um, you know, Hamlet was banished, uh, at least in the Lion King story. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, uh, he was uh, taken in by some other cubs someplace else uh, and uh, nurtured and uh, you know, eventually made his way back to the throne, I suppose. Uh, so you have an allegory there. And the allegory of the dentist, this is a more contemporary one, and the lion and the outrage around it, um, yeah. I think had some connection with the I see with Hamlet. Yeah. We're not supposed to talk about Disney, are we, in, in kind of high art world? It's, it's sort of wrong. You know, it, it, it's like the problem with object-oriented people. Oh, is wait, that Disney, Disney also has something to do with Hamlet. Have you ever heard of corporate wars? Tell me more. Well, somebody gets killed and somebody else takes the throne. Mm -hmm. And Disney is very successful and has been for a long time. And so, in and, a, and, yeah. and Panton too. And so, in a way, you could sort of see that this kind of artistic war of the isms and who's got the best ism, in a way, is a little bit like this battle of who's like the. the who's who owns the, the color? King, right, who owns the color? Right. And maybe we need to be not doing that anymore because maybe we've entered an age of ecological awareness where we realize that, like, other entities might be important 
and that we might be making them extinct, which might be making us extinct as well, right? This is with my other hat on, like I'm an object-oriented guy, but I'm also ecology guy, yeah? And I think that um, Heim's work, interestingly, is profoundly ecological. It doesn't look like it, does it? Because it's not like pictures of bunny rabbits, you know, like, 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 like even the circle of life from The Lion King sounds more ecological than what, what Heim seems to be doing, but, but I truly believe that there's something about the relationship to things that aren't you um, that's deeply activated by, by Heim's work, and it has to do a little bit with something a little bit scary, um, which is the big, bad consumerism. Yeah, like so much philosophy, so much politics, so much ecological thinking is to do with we need to delete consumerism, but I think maybe we don't need to delete consumerism. What we need to say is that consumerism isn't enough pleasure. We need more pleasure. Like, consumerism is like Pantone trying to own the colors, right? It's, it's, it's literally corporations trying to own the pleasure. We need more pleasure, lots, lots of different types of pleasure. Ecological reality doesn't mean deleting pleasure. Like, I just got wind power for my entire house because for some strange reason, Texas has a lot of wind power. I'm from Texas, so I'm therefore a synecdoche for everything that is evil and bad. Um, and I also say incredibly evil, bad things, and I, I find myself in the position of being the devil in every social situation I'm in. It's terribly embarrassing, but I, for some reason I do it. Mm. And my first thought about getting this wind power was, oh, fantastic, I'm so pure, I'm so, such a good boy, I'm so efficient, I'm so perfect. Imagine the ecological world in which perfection and efficiency was the key signature. I would like very much to not be in that world because that would be in like the language of Deleuze, a control society that made this one look like an anarchist picnic. I would not like that. What I realized two days later after I got over myself was that actually I could have like a disco in every room of my house, right? Like I could have decks and, and strobes and DJs and just people giving it, you know? And I wouldn't be harming any life forms, right? And it's like, yes, right, that's much more what it's like, yeah. Like, 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 like when you handle this bottle, it's, the, the, the bottle is kind of inviting you to hold it in a certain way. You're not completely in charge, right? Consumerism is kind of telling you, in the absence of the Pope, telling you, you know, shrimp is evil, don't eat shrimp, you should instead be eating lobster, right? In the absence of that, then, in a way, something about the lobster is saying, eat me, eat me, like in Alice in Wonderland, right? Like, eat me, drink me, right? And that's like the beginning of a non-conceptual, unconditional, which is what ecological means, truly, relationship with something that isn't you, yeah? So we all try very hard to be all cynical and like, oh, I'm, you know, I'm way above consumerism. But the, unfortunately, dudes, that's like a consumerism performance in consumer space. That's like a kind of consumerism of non-consumerism, yeah? So kind of like, that's not how you exit. How you exit is like, we need to find out what the truth of this space is, and then we need to amplify it. And the truth of the space is, we're beginning to relate to non-human beings in a less conditioned way. And we need to like amplify that. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm the devil, I'm so, I'm so sorry. I say these devil things and they suck. <laughs> desperately hoping that Haim is going to say something much cleverer than I just said. Well, um, yeah, um, so uh, what does it mean that, um, that we hear that you object-oriented uh, ontologies are doing away with the subject? Mm. Oh, right. So, you know, it's a little bit ironic right now because some people are like, please stop it. You know, when, 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 when this idea first started, um, it was an idea that somebody had who was a graduate student. And so graduate students were like, oh, no, wrong, stop, right? 
And then the guy who had the idea, his name was Graham Harmon, got the PhD. And so all these PhD students are like, oh, go away, stop it, stop it. And then eventually he got a job and now then assistant professors, oh, this is the worst, most stupid idea I ever heard of. He's trying to get rid of people. He's trying to get rid of humans. It's all very, very bad, bad, bad. And then eventually associate professors, you know, start doing. And still the idea doesn't get completely killed. And then eventually full professors, you know, attacking. And now apparently like awesome kind of art journal world. It's like, oh no, not that, you know. It's a little bit ironic because some of these guys have been have spent decades trying to get rid of like the human subject and all that kind of stuff. And it's sort of like, well, but like, can we talk about toasters now? Is it okay to talk about like dolphins or like bits of wood or like Pantone colors? Can we do that now? And and and, and so somehow those guys are like defending the, the the human, right? Because they what they think we're saying is that you know because because toasters are important, humans are not important. That's so untrue, right? It's, it, it, it's more like, because toasters are important, you are free to choose your ethical, political um, decision without reference to some belief about what reality is. And that's incredibly liberating, actually. You are totally and completely free to form whatever kind of political affiliation you want with whoever you want Right, so like me and Haim could get together with you and you and like this bottle and maybe this polar bear and let's make a re little reading group and we'll read this text. Let's see how far it goes, right? All political formations are also things and things are intrinsically fragile because things are always a little bit different from what they are. And so they have this weird little gap inside them that is a gap that you can't point to. It's an ontological gap, right? You can't point to it, but it's there, yeah. It's why things can happen. It's why time can happen, actually, right? And so, no, 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 no. We're not getting rid of anything, actually. What we're saying is that, like, you know, snails and, and, and pictures and art galleries and groups of people and trucks can also have this fun, right? We just made the fun super, super cheap. That's what we did. We took away the posh expensiveness of being a subject, because actually it's super, super cheap to be a subject, like a grain of salt, you know. One philosopher actually describes what we do as subjectalism, because he sort of thinks like, that's kind of like we're, we're allowing everything to be a subject, yeah? So yeah, this idea that there are objects and that there are subjects and, and that these subjects are like specially different from these objects, and in particular like, Let's not say it explicitly, but like they're human, you know, mostly they're white Western blokes, right? Mostly, right? If you read philosophy a lot, it's pretty like sucky. Instead, everything is an entity. Like I'm an entity, that's an entity, chair is an entity, gallery is an entity, football team is an en ent entity, right? And we have a lot more in common than we think. And and, 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 and who we are and how we are is so much cheaper than we thought. That's kind of like, we're feeling that now. That's kind of like why we can feel some kinship with some lion, right? Like there are some philosophers who are like, oh, you couldn't possibly understand what a lion is saying. That would be, that would be ridiculous. But it's like, well, no, actually, because my world is perforated and fragile and the lion's world is perforated and fragile, our worlds can intersect. Yeah, and we can totally somehow somehow have some kind of resonance there. Yeah. And I and I and I look at these colors and I and I and I look at these boxes with the colors in and I feel so invited to relate to things that are not me in a in a non-conceptual way. Right? And, and 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 there's a long tradition actually of like a left-wing way of of that. Right? It's just that we've been blocking it for a while. We all think like the like the PC left-wing thing is to destroy the beauty, right? That's obviously a bad, bad thing. Art is bad and scary, and we have to get rid of the like disturbing, ambiguous beauty aspect as quickly as possible, right? Um, but you know, I don't think you can actually. I don't think that's possible to do. I think really that's the form of Platonism disguised as left-wing stuff. It's really saying like, 
oh my God, I was affected by something like without meaning to be. Therefore, it must be evil. So therefore, we must get rid of it. You know, it's got nothing to do with being nice to like workers and stuff. You know. Sorry. It's okay. I think um, you know um, this idea about elements or quality objects. Mm. Um, the aspect of sensual objects that mm. somehow communicate with one another mm. um, implies that this is happening outside of the subject. Mm -hmm. And so how can that be? Mm. Um, but if they're all subjects, as this one philosopher mm. was uh, suggesting, mm. um, then I suppose it makes more sense. You know, I'm, 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 I'm sitting in here now and I'm having the experience that I thought I would have, which is awesome. Um, I thought I was going to be in a kind of wonderfully open, less kind of anthropocentric version of the Rothko Chapel. That's what I thought I was going to be in. I, I, I live two blocks away from the Rothko Chapel, right? And there's, there's, there's a kind of person who's committed to a kind of Benjaminian, we need to destroy the aura as quickly as possible belief who cannot stand to be in that room for more than two minutes. I, I have an experiment going, it's still running and I haven't been proved wrong yet. People who have recommitted to this idea that there's something a little bit sinister and evil about art cannot be in that room for more than two minutes. Literally, I put my watch and they're like, get me the fuck out of here, I'm freaking out, panic, you know? So maybe those people would, they wouldn't even want to come in here. They'd be like, oh, this is just bourgeois commodification. Uh, it's nothing to do with anything to do with art, right? But I personally think it's like, this really, really joyful, I, I'm, I'm a weirdo because I feel a lot of joy in this Rothko Chapel. People some feel so heavy in there, but I feel like it's so friendly and cuddly and, and, and warm. And I, and I can smell the paint, you know, and I like aubergine, you know, and I, and, and, you know, right? And, but, but, but here we don't just have aubergine, we have, we have brown, blue, orange, green, and it's not Heim's colors, it's Pantone colors. Right, and it's not me, like all those Rothko paintings are like pointing at me, like, Tim, have a religious experience now. <laughs> Th thank you for the compliment. I mean, uh, I, I hear that you're feel cuddly and comfortable and happy in the Steinberg Chapel right now. Steinberg Chapel, there you go, Steinberg Chapel. Yeah, it's, it's, it's friendly, you know. But, this idea but what about yeah. Panton? Panton? And the chapel. Well, Pantone in the chapel, well, it's like there's always wiggle room, right? There's always wiggle room. The ob object-oriented ontology is telling you that there's always wiggle room in things. Things are not completely controlled and owned by whoever puts their little copyright stamp on them, right? Yeah, but my question is, can we get past that copyright uh, uh, logo or uh, trademark uh, uh, and and uh, still experience the rest, the color, the shape, uh, uh, the object, uh, the space. Of course. Uh, despite of it. Pantone is a corporation, and, and, and I think it's very brave of Haim to like use a corporation, which is a non-human being, right, um, in this exhibition so explicitly, yeah, um, Rather than trying to own the colors himself, he's actually gone and like taken the Pantone colors, right? And, and, and made them like talk to each other and like talk to us, yeah? And that's perfectly possible because Pantone really doesn't own anything, you know? Um, so somehow it's, it's, it's like a way of talking to corporate culture, but not the same exactly as the way that we like to think is the best way. You know, it's, it's actually a better way, but like we're not, we're just not familiar with it somehow. Yeah, but I, I think that I'm talking about the color. Mm. So um, I met a, an artist uh, the other day who saw the show and was very enthusiastic. And uh, 
she was so impressed that I painted the colors on the mm. boxes. Oh, anyway. Um, <laughs> I did paint the colors on the boxes. Uh, in other words, do we paint with a brush and our hand? What's that Heideggerian mm. uh, reference to close to hand and so well, on? Well, this is the point, right? It's do we like, hold the paintbrush right. and paint it, or do we do we see the color? Yeah, and and get high on it. Yeah. Uh, so whether it says Panton next to it, right, 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 or whether it is in a fish tank of a certain right, group of people, right, 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 right. Uh, another a fish, you yeah. know, that that's among us, an object fish among us, object humans in the fish bowl. Uh, do I get the point of this? Uh, we we have think a big problem. Situation? We have a you 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 certainly do, sir. We have a big problem in our theories of action with the notion of, of passivity. Right, um, we think action is the opposite of being passive, and I'm trying to evolve a new theory of action in which acting and being passive are like a little bit more connected, right? Because basically, um, I'm trying to do a good job here. I'm trying to say the right thing, but in order to say the right thing, I have to tune into you and what you need. Right, and this is book two of Aristotle's rhetoric. Right, in, in book two of the rhetoric, there's an amazing, very beautiful description of all these different human emotions. Right, and why is that? Because really, rhetoric is not just taking a brush and making a mark on a blank surface. Right, or, or, or taking a word and making a mark on a blank person. Right, it's listening. Right, the, the essence of language is listening. Right, the, the, the essence of music is listening, right? The essence of, of painting is a kind of, in a way, listening, or what uh, Heim was saying, getting high on. You're letting yourself be affected by something else, right? We are not just Harold and the Purple Crayon making whatever kind of shapes we want on the world because we are the decider, right? George Bush is like the extreme, like, violent version of this Kantian thing. Right? I'm the decider, goo 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 joob. Yeah? That's not true. We are making these expressions and these movements and these marks on actually existing entities. Right? That's what ecology means. It means realizing that you're not just like painting the world how you want on a blank screen, you're painting the world how you want on like a polar bear, which is now going extinct because you're painting the world how you want. Right? So, um, I think that's quite profound, you know? Yeah, I'm listening and uh, also the concept of fragility, right? Yeah. Um, what was that idea about fragility uh, in terms Think, of... Things um, are intrinsically fragile, right? Like, like they're not, it's not just that they're solid and then something comes along and like knocks them away. It's that actually, because they're a little bit different from themselves, everywhere in themselves. They are going to evaporate at some point, right? By the way, uh, your, uh, your point about listening and passivity um, mm. has something to do with uh, the idea of art being in front of thinking. Mm -hmm. um, Absolutely, I, I feel like art is, um, it's like thought from the future. I literally believe that art comes from the future. You know, it's a, it's a bit funky, you know, and again, if you've got five hours, I can, I can prove it to you. Um, art comes from the future. And art is like thought that you can't put into words yet because it's so, like, it's not like you can't hold on to it and it's not part of the way things are constructed in the present, yeah? So somehow, my job is to try to listen to that, right? Like philosophy is like trying to listen to the art. It's trying to listen to the future and like pull some of that futurality. And it's not just a predictable future, it's the possibility of any kind of future, right? And, 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 and right now we're facing a world where the possibility of the future at all has really been like shut down by all kinds of things, 
You know, it's, it's been shut down by extremely efficient search engines. It's been shut down by extremely efficient autocorrect, which has now gone completely insane. Autocorrect has become mad. Like, I can't write certain words, you know, because it's, it, 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 it knows the future better than I do, apparently. But of course, not just that. It's, it, it, it's like ecological destruction, right? It's like we're actually like shutting down the future. And most important, we're shutting down future ness like the, the, the futurality, right? The possibility that anything might be different, like the feeling of wiggle room, you know? We really, really need that. We need more than just one color, you know? To be ecological, it, it, it's not just like painting everything green. It's like allowing all kinds of different color to happen, you know? And, and, and sort of like a lot of ecological propaganda is extremely about shutting down the, the, the future, you know? Um, unfortunately, it's very unfortunate. So I feel like um, Heim's job is to keep the future open and my job is to like bring some of that openness into sentences, right? If you could explain the art in a sentence perfectly, then you could get rid of the art. That's like the Hegel fantasy. Right, like, we, oh, we don't have to worry anymore because we can turn it into a sentence, right? But like, that's what you can't do. But what you can do is a little bit attuned to the futurality and like put some of that into your sentence. Because of course, who knows what's going to happen at the end of a sentence? Elephant, quasar, black hole, Milky Way, Ronald McDonald. Who knows how that sentence is going to end? Fish, Pantone, purple. Time? Question mark. You don't know yet, right? Like the meaning is always a little bit off the edge, right? It's always a little bit like, it's like the moon. It's like you're driving and there's the moon, like you're never going to catch the moon. Should we maybe open uh, our little discussion here to everyone else? That would be so great. Are there any questions or engaging? Ideas, whatever. Yeah. See, that's, this is exactly what's interesting. Um, that, um, and it's a legitimate question, um, where my authority comes in, in making this decision of choice. And um, the analogy that I can bring is, uh, and that has to do with with making art, um, or being an artist, or being in that area, just like being a poet or a writer and being in the, you know, in the in language of words and so on, um, is we, we make choices in life, and this is also a question about choice, uh, to focus in a certain area, and maybe we fall in love with a certain thing, and we begin to delve into it and read about it and study. And slowly we, we become, um, uh, find our place there in a way where we trust ourselves enough to make <coughs> decisions. <coughs> uh, and um, I think that the ultimate decision is always a kind of a leap of faith. You don't really know exactly what you're doing or why, but you trust is the right thing. So I can't tell you how I chose this green. There was no other color that I considered for that wall. You know, it just was going to be green. Um, the Lion King, um, I was 
already bouncing off different ideas and thoughts. I was going to have a show. I had a crisis. I didn't know what I was going to do. Mm -hmm. I began to have some ideas that came out of my drawing table, where I spent time thinking, where after dinner I bring my glass of wine and begin to uh, doodle around and so on, right? And uh, so I picked a book. I was reading this book. I just picked a page. I struggled with a passage. Suddenly something clicked. I made a note. And the next day, <clears throat> I had to go to, <clears throat> um, to do a project with my son's class. Uh, um, uh, the school had a benefit. And occasionally, they ask an artist to do a print. And my son is in the sixth grade. And in his school, they have an old printer that they in the sixth grade, you learn how to work with that printer, and you make prints, and you do things for the publication of the school, and so on. And um, I said, I propose that I do a project with the kids, so that it would be a collaboration with them, and then they'll do the print, which they do anyway, um, of their press. And so I said, that's fine. And I came to, I was on my way to, to meet the class, and I was in the subway. And I saw the poster for The Lion King, and I snapped the picture. Now, the reason I, what I saw in that poster was the pictogram of the lion. And I was going to talk to the, uh, the kids about each one had to make a pictogram of something that came to their mind. So a very kind of sequential, simple shape drawing of something. And I had to get them you know, uh, inspired somehow. And so now I had the Lion King, and I could say, well, look at this Lion King, that's a pictogram. Now, I've seen that Lion King in the subway many, many times, but I didn't give it one second of attention. It's like, you know, the overseen and all that, you know. But for the first time, because I was already thinking about something, I said, what about this? And that's when I, I knew it was a musical, but I didn't really no, look. I didn't know it was about Hamlet or anything, you know. And um, so I went to the class, and we worked on it. I still didn't have the Lion King as my Lion King or my work, you know. But as things began to develop with this show, as I was already working with the Panton boxes that unfortunately they don't have the Lion King image on each color in each box, you know? Now, I could have said, oh, maybe I will silk screen the Lion King on each box. Hey, that's a great idea. I just got an idea, you know? But I was not going to do that, see? Because it was not on my mind. I don't work that way. But what I did have next to that color was Panton cool gray or Panton number so-and-so, you see? So that was the same as the image of the Lion King on that yellow rectangle square. And at that point, something happened and I decided I would like to expand that. And actually, what if I would put that on the wall in the show? Now, did I know why I want to do it or what it could mean? I just decided, it came out of the way that I work, you know? <clears throat> so. Now I had to trust myself that it's okay, because what are people gonna say? I mean, they're gonna laugh at me or who knows what, right? So then you begin to think about that in context of these other ideas, <clears throat> and you have to come to a certain kind of agreement with yourself that it's okay. Can I say something about belief? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, I, I, I feel like what, what Heim's been saying is that his practice is that he allows himself to fall in love with things, which kind of primordially means he allows himself to be a little bit seduced by th things, which means that he allows himself to trust, right? And trust is a mode of belief. But we think believing, we think belief means this. Oh, like, oh, I'm not going to let this go. I believe, you know. But, but, but maybe belief isn't this. Maybe belief is that. Right, that's another way of belief, yeah? Um, and, and like somehow that's Heim's practice. He's, uh, he's, he's practicing believing, you know, which means allowing things to happen without your intending them to, to, to happen, you know? 
It's much nicer. That's very interesting. Yeah, I, I think maybe the first thing I want to say is that human beings don't have the copyright control on this rearranging business. Like, you know, bacteria seriously rearranged their world such that it was flooded with oxygen, which is why we exist and why they hid out in little cells that, that breathed oxygen as opposed to them that breathed carbon dioxide. And in the end, those became energy cells, mitochondria. Also, why are plants green? Because they have chloroplasts, and these chloroplasts are bacteria, and they're symbionts, and they've been living in these plants for millions of years. They're basically hiding from this ecological disaster they created by rearranging their world, by excreting oxygen, right? And so, in a way, ecological violence isn't about rearranging in particular, right? Ecological violence is about assuming some kind of monopoly on the rearranging business, you know, and not even accepting the idea that you, you yourself could be rearranged by something as simple as a field of green or, or, or red, right? Um, and so it's not the case that, we, that the world is totally smooth and then we get to rearrange it. That's the fantasy, actually. That's the, that's the problem. Like, the world is a completely blank sheet, and I get to do what I want with it. You know? Where do you want to go today, Bill Gates? Right? Just do it, all that kind of stuff. Right? I'm the decider. Well, the, wor the worst thing I ever heard in, 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 in the White House press conference, 2005 press conference, where the spokesperson for the Department of Defense said, well, what we do in this world is we create realities. And, and you get to study them, and you'll study them, as you will, and, and interpret them as you want. But by the time you've finished interpreting, we will have created another one for you to study. And I was like, oh my God, beat me up, Scotty. I think the world might have become a bit fascistic now. But like, the, their whole point was, we have a monopoly on the rearranging business. We, we, need, we need to let frogs like enjoy architecture. Like, why don't we build buildings so that frogs can like rearrange them as well as human beings? Right, like why why can't we build like buildings with like frogs in mind as as as, as well as our slot in mind and, and 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 that would be ecological. Another way of saying what I'm saying is that this is like the spooky, scary way, which is kind of a fun way sometimes. Is that that really there's no such thing as smooth, perfect functioning. Everything is always malfunctioning, malfunctioning in the sense of always a little bit rearranging and breaking, and also malfunctioning in the sense of the French mal, evil, evil because functioning has to do actually with appearing, you know, and, and forever, forever, forever in philosophy world, we've been thinking appearing is like, in the end, appearing is evil, right? That's why art is suspicious, because it's like telling you that actually causality is nothing to do with little cogwheels churning underneath appearance. Causality is appearance, right? When you do art, it's so obvious, it's such a no-brainer, isn't it? Like, when you do a work of art, you are directly messing with cause and effect. That's why you are a scary person. Hi, Misha Cheese. So, um, as you're probably aware, um, 
Mm. Virtual reality is what I miss. I miss. All right, that's right, that's right, yeah. May I take this first and then? Sure. Hide? So my, my first thought is no, no difference. The only problem is who controls the virtual space, right? Right now, virtual reality, so-called, is being controlled by a bunch of people who think that it would be a great idea to freeze themselves for several hundred years, whereupon the future beings will open the refrigerator and go, oh my God, it's Ray Kurzweil. Ah, my life is complete. I can live now. Everything will be fine. You know, like, what the fuck is that all, all about, right? Like, the, the, just honest, the, the, the amount of energy it would take to refrigerate those people. And then this other idea that they have, which is like, oh, well, you know, eventually blood cells will be this, you know, you can have an iPhone amount of memory in a blood cell size thing. So let's put like iPhone size thing, blood cells in our bodies. Then we'll be able to upload ourselves to the cloud. And then, and only then, Will, will we be able to be as compassionate and as loving as we really want to be? I'm sorry, we can't be that right now. We, just, we have to make a bit more money first. But like, eventually, we've, when we've uploaded ourselves to the cloud, we will be able to be... And it's like, how's that idea, which is basically patriarchy 101, been working out for the last 12 and a half thousand years? And how well has it affected other beings? You know, those are both rhetorical questions, by the way. I'm not like, expecting you to like, have a no answer to that. Um, so, yeah, the, 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 the scary thing which we notice when we see this virtual reality being created by these guys, underlying guys, is um, that causality is in the realm of appearance. The aesthetic dimension is the causal dimension. Where things happen is in there, right? So who gets to, who gets to own that? Who, who, who gets to play in that space, right? Because that's where causality really actually is right and so no there is not this difference between virtual and embodied in fact um this is kind of like why for me paranoia is just like it's like a default state of being a, a person because you're always a little bit paranoid if, if there's no difference between like the virtual world and the embodied world then where am i what am i who am i Right, and, can I, and I can never check in advance or prove in advance, right? I can't check. You, 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 you have no idea I, I could be just an Android or like a recording of myself, right? And I have, no idea, I have no way of checking that about myself either. I could just be like just a simulation of myself, right? And that kind of paranoia about whether things are people is what being a person actually is, right? Like, when we try to delete that paranoia, we get into big trouble. It's called the last 12 and a half thousand years of human beings getting it very wrong. So what struck me, which actually I like and thank you, is that you were talking about the boxes as being embodied. Mm. Now, almost 20 years ago, I was uh, at the Tate Modern in London, and um, um, there was a, a conference or a discussion about my work, and there were several people on the panel. And one person, uh, uh, a British sociologist who, I don't remember the name, um, was um, elaborating how what I do in my work is disembodied. Um, so, of course, um, she had a certain idea about what is embodied and what is disembodied, and it was not my idea. So, um, if you are virtual, you experience virtual reality. 
And if you're embodied, you experience embodiment. Um, and um, and and so um, I don't know if I uh, I'm making the connection here, um, but um, you know you are what you perceive. You are who you are. You are what you project on things. Um, this virtual reality, you know, is of course a big question. Um, my son is spending a lot of time in another kind of virtual reality. I mean, he's playing war games with friends long distance, and they talk to each other, and they're shooting people on the screen. And, um, <clears throat> and uh, uh, I find that a bit disturbing, you know? But I have to remind myself that when I was a child, we played with cowboys and Indians, and there were little toys, and we were shooting each other. And we did go to the movies sometimes, and there were war movies. Like, for instance, when I was his age, I saw the movie uh, The Bridges of Tokori, uh, which uh, was about, um, you know, the war in uh, Korea. Um, and um, there was a lot of bombing going on there and so on. And um, we all talked about it and were excited to see the movie, you know, but people were getting killed. So um, it's just another reality. Um, this, which is mediated, uh, because reading in the Gutenberg Press and all that was also virtual reality, right? It just changes the way we communicated, access to information, and so on. Um, so, um, and that also brings in this whole issue of, uh, you know, hierarchy of values. You know, if you have a very specific hierarchical concept of what embodied is and what disembodied is, you can begin to be critical and own something by uh, projecting onto other things that other people are doing and bringing an interpretation. <laughs>